This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. It's with great pleasure that uh, I get to introduce uh, this year's ANZICS oration and it's going to be delivered uh, this year by uh, George Skronsky. Now George uh, graduated in medicine in 1974 and in 1981 uh, became a fellow of the Royal Australian College of Physicians with a specialist advisory committee in intensive care, George. Uh, and George subsequently was chair of the SAC over a number of years. Around 1990, uh, George um, basically went to the federal government and argued that there was a disparity between what physicians could bill for patients in Australia versus what non-physicians could. And as part of that argument actually generated uh, what we now see as the Medicare sh schedule fees for intensive care medicine in Australia, which those schedule fees still exist today and uh, really has led to the expansion of private medicine or private intensive care medicine in Australia. George was president of ANSICS between 1993 and 1995 and in those years was actually oversaw the formation of the clinical trials group. Uh, George has also been um, uh, chair or chairperson of the New South Wales Division of the AMA and has also been chair of the Intensive Care Foundation for a number of years. So it's with great pleasure that I hand you over to George and the title of his talk is Does the Past Tell Us Anything About the Future? Thanks George. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Malcolm Fisher used to say that once you start being asked to give talks along the lines of wither intensive care, you know you're over the hill. And the ASIC's oration is definitely what Malcolm would call a wither talk, but it's a huge compliment to be able to give it. When I look down the list of my oration predecessors, it certainly includes many people who I looked up to and who I regarded as leaders of the specialty. So it really is a great honour to do this and I hope I do it some justice. So what does one say in a wither talk? The answer from various people I asked seems to be, whatever you like. So I thought I would focus on some of the challenges I see ahead for intensive care medicine in Australasia. Perhaps with the benefit of some historical insights from some of the developments I've been associated with during my 35 odd years in intensive care. Some of these interestingly have already been discussed at this meeting so I desperately hope that what I have to say is not too boring. By way of background I was in what I regard as the, the second wave of Australian intensivists though if you go right back it was perhaps more like the third wave depends how you define it I guess Essentially, the people who taught me were all self-taught. They were very smart anaesthetists or physicians who had learned about intensive care from the general journals um, uh, or from international experience or from some of the real early Australian, Australasian pioneers like Matt Spence and others of that generation. There were, when they started, no conferences about intensive care uh, no specific journals or textbooks, no colleges anywhere in the world. These people relied upon the training of their primary specialties, especially in the basic sciences, as well as what they could piece together from the general literature and by going overseas to places like Scandinavia, which was about the only place significantly ahead of us in this. They fought for recognition as a specialty and for ideas such as the closed ICU under intensivist control. The ICU I started in was a much simpler place than now. There are probably only a few people left in this audience who remember the hissing and clacking of bird ventilators and nurses checking tidal volumes with Wright's respirometers on lanyards around their necks. No saturation probes, no end tidal CO2 just daily blood gases from an arterial stab and CVP being measured in centimetres of water with spirit levels made from suction tubing and pink mouthwash. 
non-disposable transducers that the registrar had to chemically sterilise and then flush with saline and then balance, zero and calibrate by hand. And the dialysis nurses who came a couple of times a week to dialyse. And waiting a week or so for Sir to find time on his list to do a tracheostomy. And as for things like ECMO, I wouldn't have even dreamed that such a thing was possible. Mine was the first generation of career-trained intensivists. Training programs had been established by the RACP and what was then the Faculty of Anaesthetists, and there were some rudimentary teaching resources around, but we were still a non-mainstream specialty. I remember one of the more senior physicians in my hospital advising me as a registrar that choosing intensive care really wasn't a smart option. I should complete my physician training in one of the traditional specialties, like respiratory medicine, and then do intensive care as a kind of hobby. And there are a number of intensivists of my generation who did exactly that. But slowly that began to change. Uh, ANZICs grew, and people like me were mentored into the ANZICs executive by more senior people like the legendary Tech O. Now, the younger intensivists may not appreciate that the physician intensivists and the anaesthetist intensivists really didn't like each other. I don't mean personally. We were a small group and we all knew each other and it was all very collegiate, but certainly professionally. And the main reason behind that was money. Physicians were allowed to charge higher fees for consultations than anaesthetists. They still are. This organisation, ANZICS, stood apart from all that and brought intensivists from all backgrounds together. But it was impossible to really unify the specialty while that differential was there. And despite that, there was surprisingly a lot of resistance to pursuing a fee scale specifically for intensive care. People were afraid we would end up with even lower private practice income than we had already. But in the end, the government came to us wanting to do it. And it fell to me and one or two others, notably Jeff Dobb, to write and negotiate a Medicare fee scale for intensive care in Australia. And it served us fairly well, with little change really from the early 90s until now. Our success in negotiating the intensive care fees was, I think, the first real step in unifying our specialty. It was a major influence, as was this organisation, ANZICS, on the development of joint training programs and ultimately the College of Intensive Care Medicine. The, the point of all this is to say to you that we were world leaders in some of these things, but they didn't just happen. People fought long and hard for them, so you mustn't take them for granted. But some people were still critical of the fees. The naysayers predicted that people would be driven away from the full-time public hospital mainstream into private practice, and that what were regarded as the pillars of intensive care practice, clinical excellence, teaching, research and administration, would all suffer. That was one of my personal motives for pushing hard for an intensive care clinical trials group. And one of the last things I did as ANZICS president was to ask Ronaldo Bolomo to take that on and that was a choice he certainly didn't give me any reason to regret. Of the things I've had a hand in, the ANZIC CTG is probably the one I'm proudest of, even though I'm not myself much of a researcher. So intensive care research didn't suffer because of the fees, quite the opposite. And ultimately, we've ended up with a college of our own, the prospects of a reasonable private practice income, an active research group, and our clinical training is widely acknowledged. So you guys can all relax, yes? I'm afraid I don't think so. There are plenty more big issues on the horizon and some of you are gonna to have to step up just as some of us had to. So let me move on to some of those. First up, futility and the aging population. Undoubtedly, the biggest problem we now face we in intensive care sit right in the middle of this. We own it. We made the end of life a matter of human choice, 
rather than a matter of fate. We change the meaning of death. When your breathing stops, you are no longer dead. When your heart stops, you are no longer dead. You are dead when we intensivists say you are dead. And we intensivists have paid a high price for that godlike power. Whereas once our ICUs were full of young people with reversible problems, now they are full of old people with many chronic comorbidities. And yes, we still get most of them out the door because we've gotten better and better at doing that. But for how long? And with what quality of life? And at what social and financial cost? If your ICU is like ours, many a coffee break is spent discussing this. Some days I finish my ward round and I mentally count how many of my patients I reckon will still be around in a year. Where will it all end? Actually, I think it will end naturally because our society will eventually come to recognise it's simply not sustainable. But in the meantime, it's a problem that's much bigger than we are. And we can't, on our own, stop this tsunami of frail old people. Hell, I'm going to be one of them before too long. But we, by which I mean you, should lead society in this debate. We need much more information, much more good data about this, not just scoring systems, something smarter, what it's costing, what we can achieve and what we can't. And we need to take that challenge back to our non-ICU colleagues. Why are they referring us so many of these patients? Where's the justification? Why are they so reluctant to acknowledge that the cost-benefit ratio is going backwards? Do they expect us to do these things just because they know we can. And why are we being so supine about it? Is it really enough to ask families if they want everything done and passively accept it when they say yes? Are people really entitled to as much treatment as they want? These are the hard questions that we need to answer. And this, I think, is your biggest challenge over the next few years. Next issue, the hospitalists and the mega units. The two, I think, are linked. For most of my career, the typical teaching hospital ICU was 10 or 15 beds. In some places, there were separate high dependency areas or subspecialty areas, most commonly for cardiac surgery, sometimes for neurosurgery. Intensivists had only minor roles in those areas, so it was fine for that kind of ICU service to have four or five FTE specialists. Appointments to the group of intensivists were infrequent and highly selective, and it was relatively easy to main, maintain cohesion and uniformity of practice. But then three things happened. The various procedural subspecialists, of whom there became more and more, got smarter. Increasingly, things that once required admission could be done as day cases or outside the hospital altogether. I myself have been the grateful beneficiary of some of those advances. The procedural doctors essentially left the hospital along with their patients, maintaining the links only for the occasional more difficult case. At the same time, the economic rationalist movement invaded hospital management, and managers became much more powerful than doctors. We were reduced to healthcare workers, or even worse, human resources, a description I hate with a passion. Now it was all about efficiency and savings. Hospitals were businesses. No one remained in hospital a moment longer than they absolutely had to. And thirdly, there came this growing cohort of elderly people with multiple complex comorbidities. And they were the ones who filled the hospital beds because they couldn't be treated anywhere else. And for us, the intensivists, this perfect storm came together, I think, with Ken Hillman's work on medical emergency teams. The hospital was full of these complex elderly patients. The general physicians had almost become extinct. 
And the only people who were available who really knew how to manage these patients were the intensivists. And so we saw the increasing development of intensive care outreach in various forms, and ultimately what I call the mega unit, a dozen or more intensivists running ICUs of 40 to 60 beds, as well as a variety of outreach services. Great, I hear you say. Now our importance as a specialty has been recognised. ICU directors now rule vast empires. But it's come at a great cost. I think we've lost a lot of the cohesion that once made us the envy of the world. The closed ICU that our predecessors fought so hard for is being progressively diluted by more and more subspecialty consults. And most of our time is no longer spent on the management of critical illness and vital organ support, but rather on perioperative and high dependency medicine our primary skills are being diluted. Solutions? Well, it's over to you guys. Maybe we need to return to our roots and retreat to real critical care again, while some of the others do some of this general medicine. A reincarnation of the general physician, perhaps, which I see happening in many places. Or maybe our college needs to set up a faculty of hospital medicine and begin training proper career hospitalists. It'll be interesting to watch all this evolve, but again, I want to urge you, don't just let it happen. Play an active part. This is all about you and your future. And another development that I'm sure will be part of all these things I've been discussing is the advent of 24-7 in-house specialist cover. It's happening in other parts of the world, notably the US, and I think it's already starting to appear here. I'm really glad I'll be retired before this one hits, and I'll take early retirement if I'm not. But unfortunately, the logic is insurmountable. If you need an expert to manage all these complex patients during the day, how can they be managed by a registrar at night? And if you're going to roster the consultant to do nights, why bother with a registrar as well? But how will we do it? How many FTEs will it take to run a 50-bed ICU plus outreach on a 24-7 basis? How will you roster it? How often is it fair to roster a senior intensivist on nights in-house? What about when you're 65 years old? If infrequently, what duties will they do in between? Or we just have more time off? And the impact on health and family life. And can you still be regarded as a senior professional if you're a shift worker? And how much should you be expect to, to be paid for doing that? Let me tell you, I'd expect a bloody lot. Of course, there are lots of nurses here, and nurses have always been shift workers. There's another whole debate about the impact of that on their profession, but I'll leave that for someone else, because otherwise I'll get myself into trouble very quickly. So instead, let me get myself into even deeper trouble, much closer to home. This is a bit of an elephant in the room, and I think it's going to make a few people uncomfortable, and I'm sorry if I upset some people, but someone needs to say it. History and politics teach us that a president for life is a bad thing. They tend to become despots and generally end up doing their countries and their people a lot of harm, even if they started with the best of intentions. Julius Caesar, Napoleon, Kim Il-sung, Bashar al-Assad, the pattern's the same. They all came to believe their country was their personal possession. They built it, they organised its success, only they had the vision to carry it forward. Only they could decide when to step down, or maybe never. And unfortunately, so it is with some ICU directors. Some have simply stayed on well past their use-by date, causing frustration among their colleagues. And a few have been ousted in a coup. But that's not the worst of it. Over the last decade or so, 
I've had a number of ex-trainees, now in mid-career, come back to me in great distress, having been victimised or having suffered from vengeful or capricious treatment from their ICU directors. Often this is in response to perceptions of disloyalty or a threat to the director's authority. And it always seems to me it's in ICUs where one person has been the director for many years, often having been appointed to the position as quite a junior specialist. And while they may rule with an iron fist, they have no real insight into their behaviour and its consequences. They continue to believe they are just doing what's best. In Bill Runciman's words, they've come to believe their own bullshit. Because public hospitals are part of the public service, life tenure is still possible, unlike anywhere else in modern society. And because these people are always empowered and supported by the rules and by their hospital administration, their victims find themselves powerless to respond. These disputes are common in our specialty. They can be very damaging, very bitter. Units that suffer from these problems tend to go backwards, losing those good characteristics which previously set them apart. People become disengaged, uninterested, burned out. It's quickly picked up by the juniors and the word gets out affecting recruitment. Tenured appointments may have been reasonable back when hospitals only had one or two trained intensivists and our society was generally more hierarchical. But I suggest it isn't appropriate now. ICU directors should have limited tenure and they should work as the first among equals in a collegiate rather than a hierarchical structure, like an ANSIX president or a college president. I think we need to stand back and think a bit more deeply about how we work as groups of professional colleagues and how we do our succession planning. Maybe ANZICs or the college or both need to take a position on this. Maybe they need to provide mediation for some of these problems, but only if the mediators have teeth, otherwise it's a waste of time. Finally, and in a way it's related, I just want to say something about our mental health and our families. It seems to me we don't have a very good track record in this regard. I've seen people leave intensive care disillusioned, lots of divorces and even a few suicides. I'm one of the lucky ones. My wife Lorraine and my now three adult children, of whom I'm inordinately proud, have been my rock and my sanctuary through the ups and downs, of which there have been a few. I'm not sure I would have got to this point without them. So this job that we do is rewarding, stimulating and absorbing, but don't let it be your life. Look after yourselves, your families and each other. And last of all, make some time to give something back. Stand up, have your say, mould our specialty for yourselves and for the next generation of intensivists. If you're like me, you'll find that the most rewarding part of your career. Thank you. So, uh, George, I was going to thank you uh, for a very insightful and a little bit controversial uh, sort of talk, but I think the standing ovation sort of says it all. Look, uh, on behalf of the Society, um, I'd like to award you the Oration Medal and thank you very, very much for everything you've done and thank you for today. Thanks, Thanks. Andrew. Thank you very much. Yeah.